All right, so let's get this set up. I don't think, oh, let me see. Let me share this really quickly. Got a bunch of stuff up here. So it's really tough to kind of get around stuff. All right, here we go. Okay, <clears throat> that is posted. This kind of gives everyone a chance to join. Anyways. Okay. There we go. Go ahead and say hi if you guys are joining so I can see, make sure everything's good. I don't have an outline today, so I kind of wanted to wait until some ladies joined before delving into this subject of the proper care and feeding of husband's book review. Hey, Sarah. Sarah just got this book and is reading it. Okay, it just came up on my phone. Hey, Angelie. And um, so Sarah got this book and is reading it. Another lady in the group posted that she had gotten the book. It was perfect timing. So she's reading it. It is a very short little book. I have it on my Kindle, so I'm not sure. I think there's about 180 pages, it said. Um, and it has eight chapters. So these are the chapters. We've got the introduction, the improper care and feeding of husbands, the white rabbit syndrome. You're a nag. Men have feelings? Really? You're kidding. Now, chapter five, huh? Honey, what did you say? What did that mean? Chapter six, what's sex? Chapter seven, a man should a man should be respected in his own home. And chapter eight, guy time. Hey, Amber. So I will put in the disclaimer, obviously, I have to with each one. She is not a Christian. Okay. In fact, I believe she might be a Jewish lady. She is not a Christian. She's a very smart talented lady who believes in traditional roles. She does have an outside job. She does work, but she's always put her family first. She will say that. In fact, many callers will call into her show. I used to watch it years ago and say, I am my kid's mom. So basically they're telling her I am the one raising my kids. Um, saying such, there are some things in it that I don't necessarily agree with. And one of them being language, there is some language, um, not not the worst words, <laughs> but some spicy words that I would not use. So there is some language, the world's language, I would call it because I mean, she's not a Christian. So I expect that of someone who's not a Christian to use those type of words in the book. So that being said, um, you know, I think, I think the only thing would be just not listening to an audio book while your kids are around or something. It's fine to just read it, you know, when they're not around. So yeah, I finished this book in about two days. Um, the first day I didn't spend that much time. I only got a few chapters, but then the second day I made it all the way through. So it's a very easy read. She has a lot of scenarios of actual real life callers that have called into her show. And that makes up a big portion of the book and just the advice that she gave them and, um, all those things. So anyways, I'm going to try to get this done by four. We'll see how it goes. But I wanted to delve into it. Basically, I don't have an outline. I'm just going to be reading things that stood out to me as I was reading through the book. Would I recommend this book? Yes, I would recommend this book. Um, one thing that I wish she would have put in was a chapter for those who are in abusive relationships. She steered clear far. She's far, far from that. She stayed far away from that. And she even put a disclaimer at the beginning. And this is what she put. While the ideas, suggestions, and techniques offered in this book are going to improve your relationship with your husband or yours with, with your wife, if you get her to read this book, and your attitude about yourself, your marriage, and your life, it is important to qualify this enthusiastically optimistic perspective with a serious concern. As I wrote in my first book, 10 Stupid Things Women Do to Mess Up Their Lives, and reiterated in a later book, 10 Stupid Things Couples Do to Mess Up Their Relationships, the three A's addictions, abuse, and affairs 
are behaviors, in my opinion, that break the covenant and justify the self-preserving decision to end the relationship. Where the behavior of one or both of the spouses is blatantly destructive, dangerous, or evil, this book does not apply. So um, while she is saying that, she's saying that this book pretty much fits the -the run-of-the-mill normal relationship, which is probably 75, 80% of married people. It's covering those relationships. It's not covering the ones that deal with the three A's, addiction, abuse, and affairs. So if you have those three A's evolved in a, in your relationship, it's a whole different ball game. And you might just need to seek help for you and your kids if you're in a situation like that. So I wanted to put that out there. This deals with the run of the mill, normal, average married person where the, none of that is involved. And I'm going to also say I have a burn right there. That's what that is. I thought about covering it, but I, with, <laughs> with my wings, I don't care. So that's a burn. That's what that is. <clears throat> And it says the proper care and feeding of husbands has salvaged and revitalized innumerable, strained, stagnant, boring, disappointing, annoying, frustrating, and even seemingly dead marriages as real life examples happily demonstrate. I have had women calling almost daily, bitterly criticizing their men, reporting of men's of seemingly useless marital therapy, aka gripe sessions, and at their wits end about what to do with their marriages. After I ask, well, really nag them to try just one of the hints found in this book, such as finding one or two things to compliment their husbands about, no matter how small, each day for five days, they call me back amazed at the positive results in their feelings about their men, their husband's demeanor, and the atmosphere in their home. They see progress. They feel powerful. They are happier. Their marriages are experienced as more of a blessing. My deepest hope is that this book will bring that blessing to your home. She wrote this in 2003. I was married in 2001 and I did read this a few years into our marriage. So now as I'm almost been into marriage 22 years, I wanted to reread it and I can see that I needed this book when I was a young married woman because I fell into the same trap that a lot of women that called in fell into. Um, my friend and I were talking about it Um the other day and we were, or today we were talking about this book and I was saying that I do see myself in some of the younger married women in this book, but now 22 years in, I'm not anymore. Our marriage has come a long ways. I would say we are at the happiest that we've ever been, the most content, the most fulfilled. And I think partly it's because I do put into principles, some of the principles outlined in this book. Um, I'm not really sure our paths went different ways. Um, I, I do know for sure she is not still married, but um, our paths went uh, different ways a couple years ago. So I still pray for her often, pray for her kids often. So that's all I'll say about that. So anyways, at first you have your introduction and it is an interesting read. She talks about a lot of callers that call in. Um, I'm trying to find some of the places that I highlighted in this introduction. Okay, so first, I didn't highlight anything in the introduction, so we'll go into chapter one, and this is the improper care and the feeding of husbands. So um, it kind of goes into talking about the double standard. One male listener wrote to me of his frustration with this double standard. He lamented that women need to understand how frustrating it is dealing with a double standard that only takes into account the woman's immediate needs or desires. What causes this double standard mentality? In one big hyphenated word, self-centeredness. And what is the source of the self-centeredness? I believe it's a result of the woman's movement with its condemnation of just about everything male as evil, stupid, and oppressive, and the denigration of female and male roles in families, as well as the loss of family functioning as a result of divorce, daycare, dual careers, and the glorification of shacking up and unwed motherhood by choice. These are the core destructive influences that result in women not appreciating that they are perfected as are men when they are bonded in wedlock and have obligations to family. So I really, really, really like that right out of the gate, she's establishing that the feminist movement has not been good for women. It has not been good for marriages. And this is where this double standard is coming from. And I do like that she is, she is for traditional roles. She is for marriage. She is not for shacking up. 
which is even more unpopular now, you know, almost 20 years later from the time she wrote this book. So she's very much for the core foundations of a family unit, which I like that. <clears throat> she says the result is women get married thinking largely about what their marriage and what their man can do for them, but not what they can do for their man. And when there is so little emphasis on the giving, the nitpicking and pettiness chews up and spits out what could have been a good marriage. And I truly believe that you could take two people from two different backgrounds and two different upbringings. And as long as they have God first and foremost in their marriage and they have the foundations right, they can make it work through grit and determination. Some of us might have bigger baggage to overcome. If you've had hurts in the past, if you've had traumas in the past, if you've had a bad upbringing, there might be things that you can overcome. But personalities aside, I think two Christian people can make it work as long as they really, really work hard at it. <clears throat> so then there's another um, letter from a listener and she nails it. I'm not going to read a bunch of the letters, but those are good to read in here of women that kind of wake up to this realization when it comes to their husbands. The notion of love as a gift, as a verb, as an attitude, as a commitment is a revelation to some. Unfortunately, love is usually looked at as a feeling that comes over you and makes you happy. And of course, if you're happy, then you behave nicely. Somehow the notion is out there that you're entitled to behave badly if you don't feel that loving feeling. More than that, if you don't feel that loving feeling, you're entitled to get it somehow, somewhere with someone else who's available. This sense of entitlement comes from a culture that has elevated feelings over obligation, responsibility, and commitment. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. We are in a very much feeling-centered society where if you feel like getting divorced, you're going to get divorced. If you feel like being mean to your husband, you're going to be mean to your husband. If you feel like cheating on your husband, you're going to cheat on your husband. <clears throat> I have a right to be happy, don't I, is not an infrequent comment from callers frustrated that their marriages haven't put them in a perpetual Valium drip state. <laughs> and this focus on happiness helps them to rationalize their virtual abandonment of marriage and family. And they're replacing it with hobbies, drugs and alcohol, work, affairs, whining in therapy, or with friends or family or hostility directed at those who love them. This is not a minor issue. When marriages are distressed, the children are hurt and limited in their ability and hope to achieve happiness. And I a hundred percent, 110% agree with that. If you're going to make your marriage work, make it work for your kids. Your kids deserve a happy home. Your kids deserve a happy marriage. Your kids deserve the security of knowing that you like their dad and that their dad likes you. So, um, and then she gives a challenge to the women who call in that are just disillusioned with marriage. She says, I challenge them to do what they're to do what they complain their spouses won't or can't do to change. I explain that men are indeed simple creatures. And you're going to find that theme throughout this entire book. Men are simple creatures. Men are simple creatures. And she kind of gives the three A's. I hope I highlighted it in a little bit. Most men are simple creatures. And if you change certain aspects of your interaction, like magic, you will see changes in them too. I remind them that their current feelings do not need to change before they can change their behavior. I ask them, ask them to behave as if things were lovely in their relationship, a call of affection during the day, a kiss at the door, a nice outfit when at home, a request for his opinion about something to do with the family, a comment of appreciation for something well done, a hug, a good meal, a back rub, some alone time after work before dealing with plumbing or financial problems, and a cuddle at bedtime which might even get more interesting. So, and then she says, she talks about how inevitably they protest. <laughs> Why should they have to do nice things when things aren't exactly the way they want them? So she says they do, they do protest, um, but she tries to get them to do that. And usually when they start, they are astonished by the changes that take uh, place. Um, RJ, that's a very loaded question. And that's not typically a subject that I like to talk about on here. Um, I would say that, you know, look into the Bible and the Bible says that the marriage bed is honorable. So <clears throat> I would um, figure that out with your husband. Basically, I'm not on here to give my opinion on that matter. So 
Yes. I'm wondering the same thing, Angeli. <laughs> They're kind of uh, interesting questions that they've been throwing out. So I'm wondering the same thing. You got the same vibes. I don't feel comfortable talking about that. So there's even a chapter in here. Um, obviously, a marriage book is going to have a question about sex, a chapter about sex. Um, I'm not really going to delve into that very much because I just don't feel comfortable with that because every marriage is different when it comes to that subject. And um, that's something that you and your husband need to figure out. Yeah, Angelie, that's what I was wondering too. Okay, so then, um, this guy, I wanted to read this guy's listener, Ray, because this is a very loaded letter that he wrote in just kind of showing the despondent nature of many husbands who are putting up with a wife that is negative to them all the time, is just down on them. So Ray, a listener, signed himself frustrated and depressed husband. He said, I hear many of the calls from women who sound so much like my wife. Their disdain for their obligations to their husband is far too familiar. It is agonizing to listen and to know that I live with the indifference of a woman, just like those callers. I can't describe the frustration, depression, and finally, the utter despair that is the result of 24 years of neglect. I can't do justice to the efforts that I've made that I have made to salvage a relationship that should be the cornerstone of our family, but is instead a millstone around my neck. I can't explain to you the progression from loving and nurturing husband through concerned and understanding spouse to frustrated and repressed male and angry, depressed curmudgeon all the way to de desperate wretch. Just know that you must write this book. If you can save just one family, you must write this book. Ray was not alone in his lamentation. Too many men are living in this pain, having given up any hope of happiness after making every attempt to give their wives what they say they want so they will treat their husbands nice. And it sounds so elementary. Just treat your husband nice. You know, and throughout this book, I was telling Sarah today, throughout this book, you know, it just came to me that it's really not hard. It's just basically treating him the way you want to be treated. Why is it that some women are so nasty? to the men that they share a bed with, you know, and she's like, you know, I've seen, why would I treat someone that I share with my, my bed with, with utter disrespect. I and mean, I would treat a mere stranger with more respect. That doesn't make sense. So the golden rule really is just woven throughout this book. Treat him like you want to be treated. Don't treat him with utter contempt. Don't nag him all the time. Don't be nasty. Don't be mean, be pleasant, be someone that he wants to be around. It's not really that difficult. <clears throat> and then there's a joke sent in about the, <laughs> the perfect husband. Basically, a shopping center has different floors and they all have descriptions of the husband behind the door. But once you go through the door, you have you're stuck with that husband. And so as the levels go up, you know, it gets more and more crazy. Like the first floor sign reads, these men have high paying jobs and love kids. And the women are like, hmm. Okay, that sounds good, but I wonder what's on the next floor. The next floor is these men have high paying jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. The women think, hmm, what's further up though? The third floor sign reads these men have high paying jobs, love kids, are extremely good looking, and will help with the housework. Wow, said the woman, very tempting, but there's still another floor. So the fourth floor sign reads these men have high paying jobs, love kids, are extremely good looking, will help with the housework, and are great in bed. Oh, mercy me, but just think, there's still another floor, said the woman. So up to the fifth floor they go. <laughs> the fifth floor sign reads, this floor is just to prove that women are impossible to please. <laughs> and she says, oops. <laughs> so that is true, though. You know, women set their expectations so high when we should be happy with a good provider, someone who loves us, someone who loves our kids. And, you know, our husbands are going to have faults we have faults. So if we wouldn't want our husband constantly dredging up our faults, why do we constantly dredge up his? So lots of good letters that people write in. Um, but then at K, a listener sent me this email to express her awakening to the notion of gratitude, gratitude when it comes to our husband specifically. So she makes a conscious effort to do the following things. Thank God daily for such a terrific guy, mentioning specific qualities for which I'm grateful. 
look for daily ways to be a blessing to my husband, trying to understand what pleases him, anticipating his needs. This next one is a really good one. And I would highly encourage you to get an app on your phone that you can do this. It's really helped me to just be careful and shut my mouth on days I know I'm going to struggle with. She says she charts her menstrual cycle and reminds herself on the PMS days that what I'm feeling isn't true and to keep my mouth shut and let it pass. I have a wonderful life. I have a beautiful family, but on certain one or two days of the month, everything seems wrong. Everything feels wrong. Nothing seems right. And I know it's just my hormones. So when you can actually chart when that's going to be, it helps a lot more to just let yourself know, you know, I need to be careful now. So um, that's a good idea. And then avoid books, magazines, and TV shows that describe what marriage, family, and husbands ought to be like and make a conscious effort to be grateful for things as they are instead of trying to change the people around me. Take responsibility for my own emotional well-being, stay rested, don't overcommit, and then complain, stay in touch with friends with a positive influence. And I really think that is key. She goes into a lot of things in here about just these women bashing groups and um, just how destructive they are and how that will affect your mindset, your mindset to being around other women that are just constantly putting down their husbands, constantly bashing them. How would you feel if your husband was at a group session, group therapy session, bashing you and all the husbands were bashing the wives, you know, that would make you feel pretty crummy. So remember that when you go to maybe bash him and then stay focused on making a home for my family. And remember that this is my highest calling and responsibility. And that it has eternal value. The more I do this, the happier and more content I am. And I think that right there proves true for the majority of the listeners of my show. As long as you're not a hater, if you're watching my show and you are genuinely interested in becoming a good wife and a good mom and a good friend, even we talk about friendship a lot, realizing that what you're doing for God is going to carry into all of eternity. And I think that's the majority of my listeners. So that's why I think this would be So be good for everyone. Now, chapter two might not apply to a lot of you. It's more about um, just busy, busy, busy business all the time, careers. It deals a lot with women who have very stressful careers and they make that their focus and their husband really wants them to stay at home. He wants them to quit. He wants them to spend time with them. And they're just appalled and disgusted that their husband would gasp, want to spend time with them, which I don't understand that. And Dr. Laura pretty much just gives it straight to him. She's like, what is wrong with you? You've been married 20 years and your husband still loves you. He wants you to quit. He wants to be the main provider. He wants to spend more time with you. What is wrong with you? So she just lays it out for them, which I appreciate. But I like this, what she said in this chapter, she said, lives are constructed of choices. Unless lightning has struck your house, obviously out of your control, Your life is constructed out of the building blocks of your choices, good ones, as well as bad. The bad choices, self-centered, short-sighted, immature, just plain stupid, can have unpleasant consequences to marriage. There are only so many hours in a day and only so many things any of us can do and still do well. Prioritizing is a must. Without it, that is, without formally or informally listing an order of importance what is necessary and what is negotiable, The important things tend to slip down on the list. And I've said that this whole show, (laughs) have I not said this? I've said, you've got to make a list of negotiables and non-negotiables, and you have to prioritize your life. There has to be priorities. There has to be things that we will do this. We will not do this. You know, so I wholeheartedly agree. And which is probably why I highlighted it. So a lot of it is, um, about jobs and things like that. So I didn't highlight a whole lot in this chapter, but she says, I can't understand why a wife would see her husband wanting to spend time with her as a bad thing. They've been married 20 something years and he still wants to be with her. That's a huge compliment. This mentality is the ugly part of the feministic movement, which supports personal success, acquisition, accomplishment, power, and the feminist political agenda over love, marriage, and family. And so I'm really glad that she acknowledged that. And I do, um, I do believe that that is entirely true. She talks about a doctor that 
has come up with a new syndrome called hurried woman syndrome, a term coined by some in the medical community who listen to women's complaints about their busy lifestyles. This syndrome has been defined by the symptoms of weight gain, low sex drive, moodiness, and fatigue, all due to the stress caused by trying to do too much, not being able to keep up with it, not feeling very accomplished by any of it, resenting anyone who has expectations like her husband or her kids, and ending up feeling hostile and depressed. So this is a new syndrome in 2003. I don't know if it's still around, but um, she talks about... Uh, just the jobs and everything women are trying to do. And she says, many married women with children are wearing themselves down to the point that ill health and ill temper are the result. The problem is not with the demands of their husbands and children. The problem is with their notion of a full life and also their priorities. What are they prioritizing? You know, having it all begins to approximate a jack of all trades and a master of none. It is also a self-perpetuating trap. If the work is demanding and draining and your time is limited and your temper isn't, guilt usually drives one toward more activity for children to make up for the neglect and mistreatment. That translates into frenetic schedules of extracurricular activities, which end up overextending and stressing the children as well as the parents. Fast food dinners on the fly start substituting for healthy, nutritious, joyous, intimate family dinners, resulting in isolation as family members all do their own thing. And she talks about how destructive that is. So, <clears throat> yes, the thank you, Angeli. Um, it is the proper care and feeding of husbands by Dr. Laura Sh Slut. Is it Schlesinger? <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that right. So, yes, yeah, this is chapter two right now. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get through all these highlighted things. So, but let's see what she's saying. Okay. So they're talking about their intimate life. A caller called in and she said, I don't really feel like I'm ever in the mood for an intimate life. And Dr. Laura said, has there ever been a time when you were more intimate with your husband than now? And she says, well, yes, but now I just don't, I don't have time for it anymore. And you know, it's gotten boring. So Dr. Laura said, Tina, that's not a fair excuse. It's your obligation to keep yourself healthy and fit so that you can be involved with your husband. You can't do the I'm tired bit every day and have your husband just accept that this important intimate part of his life is simply going to be controlled by your whim. It's your obligation not to be tired all the time. And I like her advice here. So take a nap, eat more protein, take your vitamins. What kind of thing is that to pull on him? What if he said, I'm too tired and I'm not going to work anymore? You have obligations to each other and one of them is to not be constantly tired. <laughs> And that's true as wives. I know it's hard at the end of the day, but we have to put time into our relationships and the physical part of marriage. And you are the only one that he is supposed to be coming to for that. So you need to make it a priority and it doesn't take long, you know, half hour a day the plan. Say, I'm going to go an entire month at the end of the day, 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes. I'm going to devote to my husband alone. I'm going to fulfill his needs. I'm going to be there for him. I'm not going to be tired. I'm not going to make excuses and just see what happens after 30 days. See if that doesn't help, you know, mend your relationship a little bit. So, um, Cynthia said, do you have any advice other than just hang in for the season for a husband who's going through a lot of health, a lot health wise, and is under a lot of stress work wise. I would definitely read this book and just put into some you know, put into practice, you know, uh, what's outlined, you know, you just need to be there. Ask him, just ask him. It talks a lot in here about, and I, this is something I've always done in my marriage. It's how I run my life. It talks in here about how men are just very logical and very analytical. They just, they don't want to try to figure out what's in their wife's brain. They just want their wife to tell them, you know, if there's a problem, they want them to tell them if, you know, um, they don't like their wife, just constantly, you know, usually with men, if there is a problem, <laughs> they will just deal with it. You know, they're not going to spill out their emotions and spill out their guts. But as women, we like to vocalize our problems a lot. And men will go into problem solving mode, which I've often talked about on the show too. They want to solve the problem. They want to get to the root of the problem. 
And um, so a lot of times if your husband is going through something stressful, he'll kind of clam up inside. He won't really want to talk about it. He'll just try to muster through it. So maybe just try to find some extra little things that you personally, you know, your husband best, you know, he likes, you know, make his favorite meal, make the house a pleasant place, you know, be available for him physically, offer it to him as a gift, you know, just be nice. Um, don't put a lot of extra demands on him through the home. I've learned um, in our home, my husband is a very busy guy and he's gone every day of the week doing church related things. So a lot of things around the house, he does all the yard work still. I don't have to do any of that. But as far as things in the house, I have learned to fix a lot of things myself, you know, just not to put that extra demand on him. I've learned to be handy when it comes to things like that. And that's just something I do to help alleviate you know, his workload. So that's what I would suggest for sure. So going through this, um, I like what she says about the liberally biased media. They handle the issue of overextended women by further condemning men for not picking up the slack at home, for letting their wives take on most of the burden of cleaning, cooking, and raising the children. First of all, it just isn't true. Men do and have always helped out. Think in your own life. Like I said, when it comes to things inside the home, I primarily run that, but my husband still, he mows, we have three acres. He's constantly mowing, he's trimming things, he's taking care of things around the house, the garage, that's, you know, his, his area. And it says in the real world of humans, women have a unique urge toward bonding and nesting and nurturing. Men have a unique urge towards protecting, providing, and conquering. And I know this was written in 2003 before all of the gender stuff came out, but I love that she still believes that men are uniquely created one way and women are uniquely created one way. There, there are differences. She talks about it a little bit further. Give when they, you know, children are born, little girl, toddler, give her a baby and she'll play with it. Give the boy a truck and he loves it. Or don't even give it to him. Put him in a pile and see what happens. The little baby girl will go for the dolly and the little baby boy will go for the truck. That's just the way that we were. It's, it's our DNA. It's in us. So she says it doesn't mean men can't nurture children or that women can't climb mountains, but it does mean that beneath individual variations in constitution and temperament, women and men are different. Compatibility and harmony are best served when that difference is respected and yes, even enjoyed instead of denied or degraded. So many talented, exceptional women have found that when their feet are firmly planted on family, their creativity has a comfortable place from which to soar. And I, I completely agree. There are so many intelligent, smart women at home that are taking care of their family, taking care of their home, running the home, taking care of the children, raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And yet they're very accomplished. They have side businesses. You know, there are so many things that you can do from home. So many areas that you can delve into so many different things you can do. And you just have to know, you just have to be motivated and driven and a hard worker. So Literally hundreds of men have written to me about their pain with being marginalized after their children were born. Once their wives became mothers, they had no time to be wives. The men would even compliment their wives on being great mothers, but express considerable pain over not being shown love, affection, or sexual interest. The typical reply from a wife challenged with this was, I only have time to take care of one person and our child is that person. I'm just too tired for you. This puts fathers in the ugly and uncomfortable position of feeling competitive with and resentful of their children whom they love so much. They miss the affection, companionship, and lovemaking they used to share with their wives. They feel put aside and shut out and unimportant. Now, I will say, while I agree with this long term, um, men are going to have to realize <clears throat> that there are different seasons that women are going through. And during the first year of a child's life, that child is going to need the mom so much. I mean, they're completely on the, especially if you're breastfeeding, they're completely on that mom, completely dependent on that mom. So I, you know, I'm hoping that most women just have a mature husband that will accept this is the season we're in and will not expect as much as he did from her when she didn't have a baby or, you know, before they had children. And I do believe that men grow in this area, but I also agree with the fact that you do need to keep your husband priority. And, um, you need to realize that it's husband first and then children, your husband's needs get met first. And honestly, 
as it's reiterated through the book, men are very simple when it comes to their needs and what needs to be met. So I would say that. Um, oh, so, okay. So the three A's, she goes over these three A's and these three A's that men really need. I wanted to emphasize this, um, acceptance from their wives, approval from their wives and affection from their wives. And those three things are the most important coming from you. Think about when you were dating, think about how he would try to show off for you and he would try to make a big deal of things. Well, that doesn't stop after you're married. (laughs) He's still yearning for your acceptance, your approval and your affection. And us as women, we can say so much by not even saying anything. So you need to make it a practice to make sure that you're showing those three things. And when those three A's are restored, all is well in their world. They really just want to make you happy. And that's what the premise of this book is. Men want to make their women happy. And if their woman is not happy, it wreaks havoc on their world too. You know, make your home a sanctuary to come home to. Don't make it a battleground. Don't make it tense. Don't make it where they're walking around, um, walking around on eggshells. So yes, the book is available on Amazon. I got it off Kindle. It's on my Kindle. You can also get it very cheap off of like uh, used books. I think Abe books for America. Um, Yes, the three A's are acceptance, approval, and affection. So these are the opposite of the three A's she was talking about in the beginning that are a detrimental relationship. A detrimental will have, I think, addictions, abuse, and adultery or the other, those are the bad three A's, but the good three A's are acceptance, approval, and affection. And that's what they desire most out of their woman. So women have long complained that their men bring home, bring their work home, both in their briefcases and their heads. Likewise, then a woman should also be alert not to always be obsessed with domestic and mundane issues when she reconnects with her man at the end of their mutually challenging and tiring day. I often hear angry neo-feminists whine that it is oppressive that society, read men, expects women to flit around with a perfect body, no fat, no wrinkles, no gray hair. Frankly, there are some superficial men for whom that is true. There are. But, and I agree with this, the vast majority of men feel that attitude, demeanor, and behavior take a front seat to perfect skin. I would agree with that. When a wife behaves sexually, handles herself alluringly, and by the way she looks at her husband, touches him, talks to him, conveys her interest, love, respect, and affection, attraction, frankly, he'll go anywhere and do anything and slay all the dragons for his family. On the other hand, if she's too busy whipping him into shape so that her world is ordered and she forgets to be his companion, his lover, his woman, then he'll forget Valentine's Day, anniversaries, and birthdays. Not hard to understand, is it? And it's really not. So I've seen, I've seen firsthand so many women that are trying to whip their men into shape. And it's just, it makes for a very bad relationship. (laughs) Very. So, and she closes out this chapter by saying, the truth is there are only so many hours in a day and only so much we can put our energies into. We have to make choices. And if you don't pick your husband as number one, that favor will sadly be returned. So make him number one in your life. The next one is a chapter, chapter three. I'm probably not going to, I'm going to start flitting over these pretty quick because I wanted to be done by four. You get the main idea. I I do think it is a good book to get into read. Um, This one's about being a nag. So this is one that I believe a lot of women can feel. I feel like this one and then the chapter about um, being intimate with your husband are probably some of the ones that most women probably that watch my show are dealing with. I don't think I have a ton of just career women that watch my show or, you know, working women that watch my show. I mean, some might be in that position because they, they were thrown into that position by becoming a widow or, um, they make higher pay than their husband. So they are put in that position where they have to work for a while, but most of them are, most of my listeners are stay at home moms. And as a woman, we can all fall into this trap of nagging. So She says the universal complaint of men who emailed my website with their opinions about the proper care and feeding of husbands was that their wives criticize, complain, nag, rarely compliment or express appreciation 
are difficult to satisfy and basically are not as nice to them as they'd be to a stranger ringing the doorbell at 3 a.m. Now, women, that is not something that should be. We should not be, as Christian women, that should not be the case. We should not be the ones that are criticizing, complaining, nagging, you know, not complimenting our men. Difficult to satisfy, you know, just like the the story at the beginning with the different floors (laughs) going up. I'm drinking my drink right now. We should not be that way as Christian wives. <clears throat> um, let's see. The fact is men don't like it when women just, she's aware here, I don't approve of, so nag about stuff, Ken said. In fact, they hate it. If a man can't find peace in his own home where he should be able to feel relaxed, accepted, loved, and content, he begins to not only hate coming home, but he begins to hate his life as well. The sad reality is that often the precipitator of stupid behaviors like drinking or taking drugs, internet shenanigans, shen- shenanigans, shenanigans, and inappropriate flirting or worse, adultery. It's not just issues of domestic disappointment that women nag or complain about. Women can also just be quite negative, hostile, and demeaning about simple guy stuff. They described wives, these people that wrote her, making fun of guys when they start discussing military issues, sports, or stocks. They wrote, the same group of females would be livid if the guys made fun of their needlepoint, cooking, spa activities, or shopping tendencies. How true. Once again, the golden rule. If they, if you wouldn't like it, if they were doing it about you, don't do it about them. So yes, nagging also stands in the complain. The word complain also stands in the form of nag. <clears throat> So as I'm going through this, um, she says, I'm convinced that too many wives don't know what to do or how to communicate if they're not complaining, nagging, or criticizing. Many times on my radio program, I have suggested to women that they approach this problem as they would a new puppy. I tell them that instead of constantly screaming no to every little annoyance, transgression, or difference of perspective, opinion, or style, they should compliment the heck out of the things they like and want. Bet you that way you'll get more of it. This is sad to me because a Clarence, a listener, wrote that his wife is very much like the little girl with the curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she is good, she is very, very good. But when she is bad, she is horrid and abusive. So let that never be said of us. And he talks about in order to raise a five kid, he can his five kids. He lives in the country where his wife wishes to live. He commutes and works a total of 13 hours a day. Although he is exhausted when he comes home, he tries to find something that needs doing and would make his wife's life easier and perhaps make her the good girl. He washes the dishes. He, when the drainer becomes full, he dries them. He said, I would appreciate even a quiet thank you. But I get instead, you know, you spread germs when you dry dishes with the dish towel. So the next time I stop when the drainer's full and work on something else response, why can't you do all the dishes? So the next time I carefully stack the dishes three feet high response, you know that I greased the bread pan and I was planning on using it again. And now thanks to you causing me more work, I have to grease it all over again. So the next time when I can no longer stack any higher, I wait a couple of hours for the dishes to air dry and put the first batch away response. One of the spoons was still damp when you put it in the drawer. So next time I leave the dishes and spend two hours cleaning the living room response. Why don't you ever do anything around the house? Can't you see the dishes need to be done? So the next time I stand in front of the kitchen sink with tears running down my face, wanting to help out with something that will be noticed, but petrified, I will discover one more way to do the dishes wrong. Response, I want a divorce. I have to do everything myself anyway. I would be much happier with a quiet thank you. That is really sad. (laughs) That's really sad. You know, this is really random, but um, I found this YouTube channel came up and it was talking about how social media is a lie. And in it, this woman with eight kids, she starts talking about how her and her husband are putting on a show, a whole show for YouTube. They have a ton of subscribers, like hundreds of thousands or something. They've been putting on a whole show. And as she gets into this, um, she's talking about, this is the new word, narcissism. She's talking about how her husband is a narcissist and she goes into it. At the end, she starts giving his, her list of complaints, why he's so horrible. And it's all this. I was wincing. 
and cringing as I was watching it because it was all, he never helps. And it was crazy. Like when she got to this part where she's talking about just how awful her husband is, her whole face changed and she's a pretty lady. But when she, when she started talking just about how he's this and how he's that, her face literally became ugly. It became ugly when she was talking about how she does everything. You know, he's working a full-time job, but she still expected him to do this whole honey-do list when he got home. And why can't he help out? And I do all the doctor's appointments and I shop for all the food. And I'm thinking, he is making the money. He is supporting you. That's a huge responsibility to support a wife and eight kids. And they live in a rather nice house. So she's not hurting you know, when it comes to that. So I just, I was sad watching the video and now they're getting divorced and she was basically saying how all social media is a lie. And while I tend to agree with that sentiment, some of us are not like that. (laughs) Some of us appreciate our husbands. We're not just putting on a farce. Some of us really live at home. Everything we believe we live at church, what we believe we live at home, what we believe some of us really do believe it. Some of us are happy. There are happy marriages out there. There there are marriages that are not just putting on a show. So I just couldn't help but feel sorry for her by the end of, oh yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. I I couldn't feel, it was awful. And, you know, there were some things that he had done that he shouldn't have. I know he would come up missing. He would just leave and be gone for three days. And that's awful. And, but I just, I think of those verses where I miss Beth not being in the live chat, putting all these verses down for me. I miss those verses where, um, you know, I'm thinking of the verses in the Bible. It talks about a man, you know, going out dwelling in the wilderness or dwelling in the corner of a rooftop. And it kind of reminded me of that. So yeah, but anyways, moving on, um, a man wrote in a letter and he said, if I had to summarize, I would say. Please, ladies, recognize that we men do love you. And although you may not think we do much around the house, we do the ugly stuff, like change the oil and mow the lawn and get up early when it snows to shovel a path to your car and start the car so it will be warm when you get in. We would walk through fire for you to get you a quart of cookie dough ice cream in the middle of the night because we love you. And that right there describes my husband to a T. He does all of those things, every single one of them. And when I've had crazy cravings during my pregnancies, he makes it happen, (laughs) but the shoving the snow, I've never had to go out and shove the snow, shove, shove the snow. I guess it is shoving the snow, shoveling the snow because he won't do it. He changes the oil. Most of the time when I have to, I panic because I have to drive over that little tiny thing and it stresses me out. But most of the time he does it. If I absolutely have to, I will, (laughs) but he does the, the mowing and the trim, the trimming the trees and all that stuff. He does that. If you can't accentuate the positive, at least acknowledge it. The world is full of messages to men that there are standards we don't meet. And that's true. The media is awful to men, especially white, straight, married men. Awful. There's always another man who is more handsome, more more virile, or more athletic than we are. None of that matters if the most important person in our life looks up to us, accepts us as we are, and loves us even though we aren't perfect. Maybe there's a part of the small boy that never leaves the grown man. I don't know. All I know is that the husband who has a wife who supports him and praises him for the positive things he does is the envy of all the other men who have to live with criticism, sarcasm, and constant reminders of their failures. Ouch. (laughs) And this is an area where my husband literally has to hold me back sometimes and he has to actually tell me, Cassandra, don't comment because there are a lot of videos out there against him. Some are from the atheist community. Some are from the LGBT crowd. Some are from other Christian pastors against him. And it's very tough for me not to respond because I do think he's I see him day in and day out. I know he believes what he lives and I know the type of man he is. And it takes everything in me not to defend him when he's being unjustly attacked, takes everything in me. And, um, so I probably, you know, as women though, I, I think our men would rather want to hold us back (laughs) from saying positive things about them, you know, and let them fight their own battles 
I think our men would rather have that than living with someone who's just constantly criticizing. Why don't you ever do this? Why aren't you this way? Why do you do this? You know, so try to be the wife who your husband has to hold you back <laughs> if he is, you know, attacked by someone else or horrible things are said about him by someone else. You know, try to be the wife that you're always willing to defend your man when it comes to things like that. So that's the way I see it anyways. <laughs> She says, wives need to love their husbands as though they've never been hurt before. Otherwise, they destroy today. And I really, really, really like that saying. So let me say it again, because a lot of women have baggage that they bring into their marriage. They've been hurt by other men in their past. Um, they, Their dad abandoned them. You know, they're, they had abusive boyfriends. And they those hurts are still there. But your husband has not done that to you. So instead of living in the past, instead of living in those hurts, you know, you need to love your husband as though they've never been hurt before. Otherwise they destroy today. So, and then she goes on about women's groups and how they can be detrimental and, and you know, they're complaining and she says to surround yourself with women who talk highly about their husbands and, um, different things like that. She talks about the importance of commitment to marriage and child rearing. Um, she says when there was on respect for life and accidental pregnancy was met with commitment and responsibility because women expected it and men were accountable. Now men expect an accidental pre pregnancy to result in an abortion because society has trained them to see this as a temporary inconvenience or they expect to walk away because they've been told men aren't needed to raise babies. That's so untrue. Both mom and dad are needed to raise that baby. She goes into it about the grandiose self-centeredness, about the value of women in the feministic movement um, paired with virtual disdain for men leads women to treat men badly. Too many women look at men with a sense of entitlement versus an opportunity for selflessness. And you're going to have to exhibit selflessness in a marriage. You're going to have to put, it's both partners putting the needs of each other before their own. So she said, combine this false sense of superiority with the element of not being properly psychologically fed by their fathers, and you have a recipe for tension. Women have a hunger for being protected and cared for, whether they want to admit it or not. The hunger is amplified when there was no father in the home. So she's kind of talking about the past baggage that you can bring into this. So yeah, get rid of that. Thank you, Angelie. You're right, Angelie. If a person has ugly thoughts, it begins to show on the face. And when that person has ugly thoughts every day, every week, every year, the face gets uglier. And you can tell a lot about it, just what comes out through a person's eyes. Uh, the sparkle is gone. You know, they take on this hard look in their eyes and a lot is shown through the eyes. Okay, so I'm trying, I'm just about out of time. Um, let's go through, you're just going to have to get, you're going to have to read the book too. The calls are pretty interesting. Some of the callers that call in and she kind of just puts them straight. I really like them. So you'll have to read, um, some of those, but she says your basic male is a decent creature with simple desires to be his wife's hero, to be his wife's dream lover, to be the protector and provider for his family, to be respected, admired, and appreciated. Men live to make their women happy. The cruelest thing a wife can do to a husband is to never be happy. And don't forget, being happy is more an attitude than a reality. When things are going bad, when there are problems and challenges, disappointments and disasters, it's obvious happiness is going to be undermined. However, when one looks for that little peak hole in the sky where the sun does shine through, it is a lovely day. And it becomes a lovely day for everyone you touch. As Christine wrote, I also make the effort to pick up the toys, comb my hair, take off the paint, spit up yogurt stained shirt. I've been wearing since 6am, a little sweet smelling body spray, lip gloss, some mouthwash, and I'm ready to welcome them home with a big kiss. Some days it's more of an effort than others, but my husband does not want to go anywhere else, but to his loving home each evening. And that should be what we aspire to do as well. Then she really talks about, which I've talked about this subject before, chapter four. I'm going to quickly just read a little couple quotes from each of the four, five, six, seven, and eight. 
talking about men have feelings and it drives me nuts how women think that they can just badger and just put down and disrespect their husbands. And then they wonder why doesn't my husband ever want to be home? Why did my husband run out on me? Why is my husband gone for weeks at a time? Why does he not want to spend time with me? Well, duh. Why would you want to be around someone that was like that to you? So um, talking about how men have feelings and they do, (laughs) they just, unlike women, um, they tend to just deal with it rather than vent or let them all out. A man needs to feel strong and needed as a protector for women, basically to conquer the beast and rescue the fair maiden. What every man wants is for his woman to make him feel that he is strong in the head of the household. I'm not talking caveman style, dragging the woman around by her hair, but just as leader of the family. A man wants respect, kindness, and love from his woman. A man wants to be put on a pedestal, not so he can look down on everyone, but to show him that he is the most important thing to his woman. A man needs his woman to show him that she needs his strength to help her through life. The man should be the major breadwinner in the family. Every man needs a battle or war to win to prove himself that he is strong and capable of conquering any and all dragons that life throws his way. Taking care of his family by working and providing are his battles. A man needs enthusiastic approval, appreciation, and respect from his wife for being a competent man, husband, and father. A man needs his wife to show some interest in his in his interests, especially when it's an activity she may not get or like. Just being there is important. A man needs his wife to greet him after work with love and enthusiasm. A man needs his wife to care about the day he's had. A man needs to know that his wife is sexually satisfied by him. A man needs his wife's wife's encouragement in order to be a man. Very good tips right there. And she has received a lot of hostile criticism for this book, talking about how it's in the dark ages, you know, woman's lib, blah, 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 all that stuff. But what she's saying is true, especially if you're aiming for a Christian marriage where you understand the true dichotomy of how your relationship should be. And then chapter five deals with not expecting men to read your thoughts. I've always been a proponent proponent for just telling your husband what's wrong, telling your husband what's going on in your head. Don't make him guess. So she goes over that. Then she talks about the differences between men and women. They begin in the womb and even the differences with communication. And they're even apparent early on in childhood, which I thought was really interesting study that they did. And then she talks about the major mistake wives make in communicating with their husbands is to imagine their husbands are supposed to be their best girlfriends. And let me just say, while my husband is my best friend, as far as he is the closest human being on earth that I, I'm the closest to him out of anyone. I do believe that my girlfriends that I'm best friends with, I have a couple in my life. They are the ones that when I need to vent, I go to them. (laughs) about situations in my life, because I tend to, if I, if I vent to my husband, he wants to fix it, which I've talked about. So I do think it's very important and very good that women have close girlfriends that they can vent to, you know, um, if they're having a bad day. And I've noticed the ones that I'm closest to throughout the years are the ones where we had common interests. We were having a hard time homeschooling. We have a hard time, you know, with planting the church, you know, whatever it is. And that's why um, I don't really feel the need with my husband so much because I do have those other outlets. So most women I remind of this error get hostile as though I'm taking away some entitlement. I inform them this is simply an erroneous, erroneous expectation. When they don't want to accept that, I remind them that their way isn't working. The proof is that there is too much rancor and distance in their marriage. And maybe they ought to try seeing what treating their husband as men will bring that's different from what they're seeing now. So I agree with that advice. I definitely agree with getting an outlet. Um, If women would simply look at their husbands as having characteristics instinctive to male nature and not fight against those characteristics, they would find there would be less quarreling and fighting. Carrie concluded, by suggesting that women tend to fight against the natural characteristics of men more than men fight against those of women. And I believe he's right. And I think so. Men tend to love our femininity. Men love that we're different. They love that we're more gentle. They love that we're more kind. And um, they don't really fight against that as much as women fight trying to get their men to act more like their girlfriend. 
kind of strange when you think about it. So <clears throat> there you go, Angeli. I did. <laughs> So she says it means, um, so she's talking about, um, there was a Sarah May, one of her listeners was writing to her. She began to realize that she was being demanding, criticizing and bitter towards her husband. And she was working against her vision of a happy, long-term growing old together relationship. So she tried to give it a new, um, concept to try. And I learned that the very thing that attracted me to him, his masculine, laid back, quiet, kind demeanor was what I was holding against him. Instead of appreciating how those qualities enhanced our family, me being the more high strung partner, I learned to create a brand new list of everything about him I loved and appreciated, conveyed my love and appreciation to him in small everyday acts and made him feel he was truly my hero. I felt the best of my femininity again, and so did he. I also learned to rely more on my female friends for the emotional connections I so craved and had wrongly expected my husband to provide for me when it was not in his nature as a man to go to the depths that women are able to go on an emotional level. Now, I will say in here, I, I do believe that your husband should be there for you during difficult times. I'm not saying that you shut up this place off completely. I'm talking about overwhelmingly complaining about the same things, because if you're constantly complaining about the same things, they're going to want to fix it. Um, Maybe something is going on in your life that would make him negatively view members of your family. When you know it's going to be worked out, you just need someone to talk, talk it through. Maybe that's a situation I'm talking about, you know, something that would, you know, negatively impact his view on one of your family members, your mom, your sisters, your brother, your dad, you know, something that you don't want him to keep carrying. So that would be a time to go to your girlfriend. So but it does mean that if your husband doesn't say all the flowery things you think he should, because you watch too many chick flicks, you should look at what he does. When he scrapes the ice off of your car windshield, that is love speak. Men are made of action. Action is largely how men communicate and talking about the shoveling the snow and starting your car and doing the oil changes. They are men of action. They are problem solvers. They're not one to sit around and gab about their feelings. You know, that's just not men. And why, why? are we trying to change them into something more feminine? It's weird. So when a wife wishes to communicate something important to her husband, the black and white approach is the most effective. That means forget the subtle hints. I've never done subtle hints. Mark, a listener complained that wives give hints and don't just say what they want. If I want something, I just say it. Wives have to beat around the bush and not just simply say, I want this. <laughs> not me, other wives. <laughs> so they're saying to just say it. And then it talks about just not, if a husband doesn't want to talk about it, just stop trying to dig and nag and complain and dig it out of him. Most men, and I found this way in my own marriage, um, they can't be drug into talking about something that they're not ready to talk about. Men tend to be, at least with my husband, if, if there's something he's going through or a situation, he literally will not want to talk about it until he's figured it out in his brain. He has to think about it. He has to analyze it. He has, and if I'm trying to pick his brain, he's like, I don't want to talk about it. He just, he hasn't figured it out yet. So men tend to be problem solvers. And if they haven't figured out this problem in their brain yet, they're most likely not going to tell you as well. It's not that they're not close to you. It's just, they work differently and they think differently than we do. So <clears throat> since it's not in men's nature to open up about feelings, it's counterproductive to bombard them with questions and push, push, push. Let's go back to that male physicality point. Mostly husbands just want to be heard, hugged, and supported, which means don't overanalyze or as Gary, a listener wrote, then he wrote down what that is, but I'm trying to, there's a lot of good thoughts in there, but I'm really, I'm out of time. So, and then there's a book about um, the intimate relationship. She talks about don't develop the frump syndrome, you get married and you just lounge around in flannel pajamas and socks and oversized t-shirts, um, not shaving your legs or grooming, not washing, not styling or combing your, your hair, um, not freshening up your makeup where your husband can see you, not putting on, you know, a little perfume or an outfit he likes. <laughs> so she says, don't develop frump syndrome. And I completely agree with that. I didn't highlight a whole lot in this chapter because it is, um, it kind of gets nitty gritty a little bit and where I don't think that that's necessarily a 
a bad thing. I just am not comfortable with talking about it on this show. I want to keep this show completely G rated when it comes to this. And it kind of even creeps me out a little bit when Christian couples will just publicize everything about their physical relationship and just put it out there for everyone to hear. That's creepy to me because this is a very personal private thing between only you and your husband. I will say though, that this gift of being intimate is <clears throat> one of the most important gifts that you can give to your husband because you are the only well that he is supposed to be drawing water from. <laughs> you are the only sister and he's supposed to be drinking from. And so you need to be the one to satisfy him in this area. And it should be more than a chore. It shouldn't be something that you feel like you're forced to do. You should willingly and happily give yourself to him. And I think if a lot of couples paid attention more to this area, it would solve a lot of the other problems in their marriage, such as feeling, feeling close to each other, communication problems, not just feeling like your roommates, not just feeling, you know, having that special connection that only you and your husband have. So that's what I will say about that subject. I did not barely highlight anything in that. You can read it though. Um, I think the majority of the stuff I agree with, um, but, and then it talks about respect and how a man should be respected in his own home. And I totally agree with that especially when he is the final, you know, the main breadwinner, he is doing a lot to put that rope over your head and just appreciating that would be, um, huge. It would be huge. So, so I'm going through it. It says it's more in the female. She says it's more in the female nature to nest and nurture. It's more in the male nature to conquer and protect, which she said before, frankly, the more we ignore the true inherent masculine and feminine qualities of people, the further apart we pull them. And I agree with that. <laughs> Sarah, we all have down days, believe it or not, Saturday. Um, I ha I woke up with a horrible migraine and I stayed in my oversized gently led sister's t-shirt and my pajama pants. I stayed in it pretty much the whole day. Um, it was about noon and Kelly was like, mommy, why are you in your pajamas? You need to get dressed. So I did change into a jean skirt, but I kept my oversized gently led sisters t-shirt on. I did not do my makeup. I had my hair pulled up in a messy bun because I just was not feeling it. And we're all going to have days like that. So especially with young kids, but I do try to the majority of the days, almost seven out of seven, it was six out of seven last week. I do comb my hair. I do style it some way. I do put a makeup. <clears throat> and part of that is because three days I'm teaching lessons online and they would be scared if they saw what I looked like when I rolled out of bed, but just be careful not to get into that all the time is my suggestion. So anyways, um, I did like this part. She says, instead of appreciating a man for his unique and manly qualities, too many wives constantly complain to the husband themselves and to friends neighbors, families, and sometimes even to the children. One caller recently, and this just blows my mind. One caller recently asked me if she was wrong to vent her annoyance with her husband to her 10 year old son. She said her husband told her she did that if she, that she did that to recruit their son to her side and their issues and therefore undermine his bond with their own child. And I would agree in her own defense. She said that she thought her son had a right to know what was going on. And she admitted she wanted his sympathy. Not only is this disrespecting a husband and father in his own home by trying to make him look bad to his family, it's completely inappropriate and psychologically abusive to burden children with parental issues and force them to give up one parent for the sake of the other. And I completely agree with that. Um, I suggested, and she was agreeable, that she apologized to her son for triangulating him into their skirmish and that she apologized to her husband for such dirty tricks. So good for her. <clears throat> good for her. So then it just goes on just about respect. Um, what does it actually mean in concrete terms to treat one's husband with respect? To start with, a man likes and needs to be treated like he is the man. That seems to be difficult for a lot of women to do, partly because they have been brought up with notions of unisexuality, the sadly mistaken and destructive belief that men and women have no differences. And whatever men want or do that women don't appreciate, it is stupid, wasteful, and self-indulgent. Well, the fact is men and women are different psychologically, uh, physically, and motivationally and temperamentally. Anyone who has had exposure to babies and children can tell you that boys and girls respond differently to the world right from the start. And I agree. 
Um, I don't, I believe that most women don't appreciate how much they are responsible for, for the tone of the home and the entire family. This statement is not about placing fault or blame. It's about acknowledging the incredible power women have in impacting those around them. Both children and husbands are inexplorably dependent upon the approval, appreciation, and acceptance of mom. Without that, they are desolate and they behave badly. And I wholeheartedly <clears throat> agree with that too. So um, men rescue, repair, provide, and protect. Men don't sit, stew, and rehash. Men are active and proactive. They do that out of love, duty, responsibility, and character. That needs to be respected and appreciated if a woman is to have a happy life married to a good man. A good man is just that, a man. A good man is not a best girlfriend. And I agree. So let me skip here to the end. Um, she says, as long as women disrespect what they have to offer as wives and mothers, they will continue to disrespect their men who serve as husbands and fathers. No one benefits and no one is happy. And then her very last chapter is one about guy time. And this was probably one of the things I struggled with as a new mom with three kids, three and under is I didn't want him to have any interest in hobbies. I wanted to be his everything. Like he was with me all the time when he wasn't at work and it just, it wasn't it wasn't healthy. He needs his own time. Now he does races. He works out. He goes kayaking and all those are good things because it puts him in a happy frame of mind. And I've learned to realize that just like I need some downtime throughout the week, he does too. So I happily, I never, I happily even suggest it. Sometimes you haven't been kayaking for a while. Why don't you go? You know, you haven't been on your bike for a while. Why don't you go? So I think it's in our best interest as wives and moms to realize that our men do need time to kind of um, reinvigorate themselves. So <clears throat> so it says many women expect their husbands to always bend to their, the wives, women will, but that their lives are like a letter, completely dependent upon someone else's writing. In other words, marriage should not mean that either partner takes complete responsibility for the other's well-being, activities, or state of mind. Marriage does mean we share, but it also means we support the individuality necessary for mental and emotional health and for the ultimate well-being of the relationship. And I would say that where men, I don't believe, think that their wife needs to fulfill their every need and desire for every friendship and, you know, relationship, I think as women, we need to be careful, not expecting our husbands to fill that because they won't. Um, I think many of us get married having this false sense of a knight in shining armor that he's just going to be there to fulfill our every desire and every whim. And it's just not reality. And it, it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't have so much wrapped up in a mere human. <laughs> he's going to fail. He's going to let us down. And we need to realize that we each have individual pursuits. And my husband and I are really good about that. We do each have individual pursuits and things that we do separately. And it keeps our minds sharp. It keeps us wanting to be together when we do have spare time because, you know, we're not, we do have individual things that we do. So it makes us look forward to our time together more, I think. So, um, so yeah, it just goes through and that's about it. I want to end with one, let's see. Okay. I wanted to end with one last quote that she says, she says um, that these universal truths that she's mentioned numerous times through the book, and that's that men are raised by women as children and they're embraced by women as adults. And they look to women for those three A's. This gives women tremendous power over men, power that ought not be abused or overused. It's just too easy for a grown man to turn into a rebellious child. And that's another thing she didn't really even mention, but I can't stand it when um, women treat their men like overgrown children because they're not our child. They're our husband <laughs> and it's completely two different things. So, you know, you need to be careful not to fall into that trap as well. But it was a good book overall. I mean, obviously there's, I don't agree a hundred percent with any books. Um, whereas I feel like I was telling someone this, I think I was telling Nicole this, I feel like created to be has helped me did have some good points in it. And she used scriptures are out there. You know, I don't think 
Laura uses any scripture in her book, but I felt like created to be his help me. Maybe I'm totally wrong on this came from a place of writing, being married to someone that's a very difficult man. I don't feel like this book is written from that place. Um, I don't get the experience that she's dealt with abuse in a marriage. And as far as I know, her and her husband are still married. Um, but she deals with a lot of, she deals with a lot of letters that women write in and, um, goes off a lot of experience. She counsels women all the time. You know, she has this show about marriage and family and women are always calling in and things like that. So, um, I think she deals with it more from that aspect. I also didn't agree with Debbie Pearl's um, advice about staying with an abusive man. And Laura puts it in the beginning of her book that she, you know, says that that book is not for people that are in, I think Debbie Pearl like tries to delve into that subject and maybe did it poorly. Whereas um, Dr. Laura did not even touch on that. So that's a whole different ball game. Like I said, this book is for more of the average run of the mill relationships where there is no abuse. There are no addictions. There is no adultery involved. If you have those three A's in your relationship, it's going to take a lot more counsel from people that have dealt with couples that have gone through that. It's going to take time for you to work through that, move on all that stuff. But this is like the basic advice for just, you know, Tom and whoever what's a common name, Tom and Sarah. <laughs> it's just, you know, run of the mill advice for regular couples like that. And I went too long, but I always do on book reviews. I read a lot and I even skipped over a lot that I had highlighted, but it is a pretty good book. It is worth your time. Like I said, um, take what you like and leave the rest. There are a few things I don't agree with. I don't like the language, the use of language sometimes um, through it. And there are some things that maybe I don't totally agree with, but overall it's a good, it's a good book. And I think that the only, I think the reason here, Jenny, I think I have to make you a moderator, but it does, it's not giving me the option because I'm not signed in under my gently led sisters account. I'm signed in under my regular account. So that's why it's not letting you link it. You have to be a moderator. But yes, um, what did she say? She found, someone found a free Kindle version. Oh, if you have prime reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I did not. I think I paid like $10 or something. Yeah, I paid $10 for mine, but it's worth it. <laughs> it got a good, I got a good book and a good book review out of it. So if any of you read this book and you have, I want to hear your thoughts about it. You know, put your thoughts in the comments below, um, put your thoughts in the Gently Led Sisters group on Facebook. If any of you read it, just go ahead and let me know what you think about it, because I'm interested in knowing what all your thoughts were. So all in all, I thought it was a good little read. Um, I definitely think that it has some good advice for newlyweds, especially not to fall into these traps, maybe kind of head it off at the past before it even happens. Um, okay. You sent me the link. Where was the link? Okay. Here's the link on Facebook. So just a second, I'll go grab that link and I will put it on <clears throat> the live chat. Okay, here it is. Technology. Um, copy link address. Let's try that. And then let me put it here. Oh, it says it was too long. So let me see. It says the link's too long. Um, here, let me do it this way. Maybe share. I'm not logged in though. This is through an actual library. It looks like, um, yeah, this is through an actual library, but it's not letting me paste it. Cause the link is too long. Oh, wait a second. That might have worked. Okay. Yes. There we go. Now you might have to make an account here. It looks like it's through some library, but it is on ebook on here for free. So I don't know how that all works exactly, but there it is right there. 
for you guys. So I am going to let you go. I'm having a guest on next week. We are going to talk. I think we're going to hit on a couple subjects. Um, soul winning with large families. And then are so like soul winning tips when you have lots of little kids and large families. And then we're also going to hit on um, just how kids should behave in church, training them to sit through church, which I'm a work in progress on this, even with seven and eight, because we're doing it right now with Kelly and Hannah. It's great. So, um, you know, just church etiquette, basically just church etiquette, how you act during the preaching, you know, different things like that. So, um, I'm going to have Mrs. Ashlyn Thresher on next week, and we will talk about those, those subjects. So, I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I hope you have a great week. Sorry I went longer, but it is what it is with these. So we'll 